Welcome to the Hus Guys Podcast. Oh yeah! All right, Dave. Can we kick off? Hit us with uh, the intro. Yeah, what's up, everybody? It is June thirteenth. Uh, we've got a big time guest. We are super pumped about this. Probably the biggest guest we've hit on the uh, Hus Guys podcast since we started. From Solid Verbal, we'll get a proper introduction here in a second. Uh, but before we kick things off, uh, quick word from our sponsors. We kick out actually not sponsors. It's just us. Uh, Todd, you're new to this, but you'll uh, awesome. yeah, you'll appreciate this as we get an NIL conversation. Uh, we started as part of the Husk Guys business, uh, Pipeline Jerky, named after the pipeline back when we were good at football in the '90s. But we're coming back. Uh, pipeline Jerky is named after the dominant offensive line from the 1990s. A jerky business created in name, image, and likeness. The offensive line gets a royalty of every bag that is sold. Uh, we're having a huge Father's Day sale right now. Things are going great. We got some pipeline steaks. We got pipeline jerky. So guys, check out pipeline-jerky.com. And then uh, also, Ty, something's coming your way if you're comfortable sharing your address at some point. But we'll uh, we'll send you some <laughs> delicious jerky after this. And we'll then, see how this uh, goes. As always, some Husk Guys merch uh, off-season championship is well underway, as well as the Kool-Aid. So go to huskguysstore.com. Uh, check it out. Get some merch. And Andrew, give me a proper introduction, because this one this one deserves a proper introduction. Yeah, so um, around 10 years ago, um, I was listening to this amazing podcast. Um, and Ty and Dan have been filling our ears, especially on, uh, around Thursdays, my college football preview every week, uh, every Monday and Tuesday, I'll sail the site, the high seas with them. Uh, they put on the shows several times per week. Uh, these guys are dedicated to the craft. They know more about your own team a lot of the time than you do. They break news. They do it all. And honestly, Kind of living the dream that I always like thought I could live, but then I thought this doesn't seem practical. Yet somehow they've broken through. They've got a huge following. They are living the dream. All they 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 talk college football for a living. How awesome is that? This is Ty Hildenbrandt. Ty, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, fellas, I appreciate the invite. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, having me on. Hundred percent. So, Ty, the. Big thing that we kind of want to get into here uh, to begin with. Um, you and your co-host, Dan Rubenstein, you guys met on the field after the 2010 Texas game. Uh, first of all, tell us about how this all came about. Tell us about the solid verbal. And then we're going to get into kind of the game experience because here's the, here's the cliffhanger. I was also at that game. And I was also on the field after the game. So, <laughs> but okay. tell me a little bit before beforehand. Tell us about the solid verbal. Uh, tell us what brought you guys together. Yeah, well, uh, the the solid verbal started in earnest in 2008. And for people who are listening to this in podcast form or just watching somewhere on the internet, um, 2008 is before podcasting as a word was mainstream nobody really knew what that was it was kind of this foreign concept you couldn't go into a sports bar and say how hey, mom i run a podcast and expect to get any kind of answer uh, people would look at you like you had two heads so at the time um dan and i were both freelancing for sports illustrated he was doing video work i was writing a column and um he had shot a video at my alma mater which is penn state and uh, I was at the game, I think it was Penn State versus Notre Dame. So I just reached out because, hey, we work for the same website. I wanted to compliment him on a job well done. And over the course of like the next year or so, we kind of struck up a friendship. We had an email correspondence going. And at the time, I had done some like early stuff with podcasting dating back to like 2004, really, truly the early days of it. And we just kind of had this idea to... I don't know, play on our shared love for college football and try to start this college football thing. And that that was sort of the origin story behind the solid verbal. We started it in like August of 2008. We've been running it continuously since then. So um amazing. Yeah, it's been it's been a long time going. Um the joke though with respect to the slide that you've got up on the screen right now is that for the first two, three years, I'm not great at math, that we did the show, 
we didn't meet. It was entirely virtual. He was in <laughs> California. I was in Eastern Pennsylvania. And through somebody who listened to the show, who at the time happened to be the video director for Nebraska football, we got press passes to come Amazing. to Omaha to watch them play Texas. And so, yeah, we, we met for the first time. Or I should say Lincoln, excuse me. We stayed in Omaha. We drove from Omaha to the game in Lincoln. Yeah. And uh, that was the first time we met in, in 2010. Um, and we were down on the field for a good chunk of that game. I remember distinctly there was, I think it was whoever the kicker was for Texas at the time, kicked the ball through the end zone. It was coming right to me. And I had never been on the field before <laughs> for a game. And so I was terrified to try and catch it. It would have been the easiest catch in the world. But instead, <laughs> I stepped aside. And whoever the dude was that was working the field goal kicking nets at the stadium was the one who ended up catching the ball. The whole crowd cheered for this guy. He <laughs> kind of walked out a few steps and held the ball out. It was like the highlight of this guy's life as a Nebraska football brethren. And uh, so in that sense, at least, I was glad that he caught it and not me because it definitely meant more to him. But um, that was kind of my first experience being on the field, meeting my co-host. Um, obviously, you've got the score up there. Um, I don't remember a whole lot from the game. You guys probably remember a lot more than I do. But Oh, do we ever? It was it was my first time at Nebraska for a game, and it was a great experience. And uh, you know, I'll probably remember that till the day I die. So oh the kicker God. was uh, the kicker was Justin Tucker, by the Justin way. Justin Tucker. Uh, yeah, okay. so that, that would have been a big time one for you. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> it could have been your moment. So yeah, long long story short, I mean that was 2010. Um, we're we're obviously many years later. The the solid verbal continues to churn. We're just starting to get ready for the college football season now. Um, it's getting a little bit bigger in the window, as I like to say. And um, we're we're gearing up for what I think is going to be a pretty awesome season. Oh man! So after that that game had ended, um, I like to think now that I've listened to probably over a hundred of your pods, maybe probably numbering in the several hundreds. I think I could have been a part of it if I just like had my head up, you know. Like I think I could have been your third guy because I was on that I was on the field that day. Yeah. What was crazy was after the game, I'd never stuck around that long, but we lost and I was moping and miserable because we were top five at the yeah. time. Yeah. So and we got five. up and we got upset by an unranked Texas and uh, just moping around. And then they like just all the players cleared out and then they had like opened the gates and stuff. And then we just got to walk around on the field after. <laughs> I was like, is this just where this is where the sad people go? Right. Yeah. But uh uh, anyway, so you guys were working at Sports Illustrated, um, kind of freelancing as well beforehand. Um, when did you, I guess, realize like, because right now, I mean, you look at you now, you've got the Patreon going where you have, uh, you know, monthly subscribers, you have the Instagram, Facebook, the podcast obviously is huge. Like, when did you realize, hey, I want to do this? Hey, you want to do this? Like, we're going to make the jump and do this like full time. Well, um, you know, it, it, it took a while, frankly, to, to get to this point. I mean, we had a pretty big break in 2010 or 2011. I forget the exact year when Bill Simmons and, um, at the time his grantland.com website were launching a podcast network of sorts. And so they kind of put together a curated list of podcasts that they liked and put them in front of all of their followers. And that was like a big deal for us. We brought a lot of new people aboard just in the one year that we were kind of affiliated with Grantland. And it just sort of built from there. You know, we, we've been doing this long enough. And one of the things I think we learned along the way is that we, we had different indicators that we could look at to figure out, all right, like there's a lot of interest in the state of Texas in college mm -hmm. football. We should bring more Texas guests on to talk college football. And we would go state to state doing that and trying to build ourselves up as kind of like a national voice in the college football realm. And you multiply that out over, you know, a decade plus at this point. And we've built our following very, very organically over the mm -hmm. course of uh, a, a long time. It wasn't until fairly recently that it became more of a real thing that we could kind of focus on this as a full-time thing. Um, mm. You know, I, I worked a day job up until 2021, a pretty demanding oh, wow. day job 
that Dan Forever had sort of cheerleaded me to quit so that we could focus a little bit more on this, but it really wasn't until um, we kind of got ourselves sorted out on the business end, which is neither of our strong suits, to be honest. It, it wasn't until then that it it kind of became possible and we built a little bit of a team around us that could help us do that. So it's it's been a slow build, to say yeah. the least. And um, in, in earnest, it wasn't until like the latter half of 2020 when, you know, obviously there's this horrible pandemic going on, but podcasting is also having a yeah. moment because everyone's at home oh. and no one, you know, people are just like starved for connections in any way they can get them. <laughs> What do I do? Um, I'm just going to start a podcast. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody started a podcast in 2020. Um, right. That was, there was like an explosion of college football shows in 2020, I think as a result of just everybody who's at home and needed something to do. But mm -hmm. that, that I think was, was more the moment for us when, when we kind of put two and two together, like, all right, let's, let's go for this. The, the, the real defining moment for me was we, we did an interview with Matthew McConaughey. Um, I, I want to say in the fall of, either 2019 or 2020 wow and it was at that point where i came downstairs from the studio sat down at the kitchen table with my wife shared more than a few drinks for like a wednesday night because i was just <laughs> so amped up after this interview and that that was i think the moment when i kind of gave my myself permission to at least explore the possibility that i could jump into this so that was a couple wow. years ago now and i'm i'm you know, very privileged to kind of have this now as my day, my day job. But, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a long road with, um, you know, pretty humble beginnings to say the least. What can I ask? What, what was your day job? Were you writing or were you doing something totally different? I was in charge of like the digital media operation for a fortune 500 company. Oh, wow. Mm. So totally different than college football. I love to it. Totally different from college football. It was weird because everybody there knew that I was doing this. And so I had to try my best to not cross the streams and make that yeah. weird. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to show respect to my employer and not say anything that would get me in trouble. Um, but I, I came to a real point in 2020 when the job was amped up in terms of responsibility and the podcast was obviously yeah. continuing to to grow in a really meaningful way. And I had to pick one. And so yeah, did I, you have like a dramatic moment with your boss? It's it like was a either, dramatic moment. I mean, it's I, either I, us or the podcast. No, you know, it was it was funny because I was like crazy emotional about it. I it was the only place I had ever worked. I got hired right out of school, and I, I've said to like everybody who would listen that it was like breaking up with my family. It was really <laughs> hard to do, but I knew it was the right thing to do. And uh, yeah. you know, I think the show's better for it, and you know, I I know I'm happier for it as well. So. It, Thankfully, it all worked out. It's awesome. Man. Well, we, we love let's, let's be hearing this type of stuff because this is the Andrew and I's dream. Well, at least it's my dream. Andrew's, Andrew's a, a doctor during the day. So I don't know if like <laughs> doctors turn into full time podcasters, but that's what I want to do. <laughs> so I, I love it. I just like, like my first love. Yeah. Anytime you get asked the question of like, if you could just do your dream job and do whatever you want all day, be like, I would just talk Nebraska football like 100 <laughs> to 200 hours a week. That's probably it. All the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm very lucky that I get to do this. So and, and beyond with luminaries such as yourselves. So thank you again. So good. Well, one of my uh, favorite bits that you guys get into. Um, well, I guess I'll just broaden that. Like I think one of your, the things that you guys have become best at, um, just listening to how the show has evolved over the years, is number one, you have some recurrent bits, and then number two, you've got a, a way that you kind of. Um, connect with each fan base and you know kind of the ways that to kind of uh you know it's not just like here's some surface level stats it's it's a little bit more of like the a deeper dive into the fanhood and what makes each fan base each who they are um, but one of the best bits you have is how to talk to your kids about Iowa winning uh, for a Nebraska fan. Like it's every time you guys say it, like, okay, we got to sit the, you know, we got to sit the kids down. Kirk Ferentz is at it again. Yeah. And that just, uh, I, I think that just ends up locking me in. But what do you, um, how do you guys see yourselves as uh, like continuing to build and, and, and going from here? Like, how are you going to keep broadening the scope? Well, that's kind of the question for every off season, right? I mean, we've got some stuff we're working on now and um, we always have more ideas than we could actually execute on, but that's a good thing. Um, my co-host Dan is kind of like a creative genius. And um, I've said for a long time, the creative engine behind what we do. So we, we always have a million ideas. We 
kind of whittle them down into the ones that we think are are, are most doable, and we we go at it from there in the off season to see what's available. So we'll mm-hmm. you know we'll see what this season brings. But I just in general, I mean, we kind of see ourselves occupying this lane of being college football fans who are optimistic, are not blind to the changes in the sports in the sport, the cynicism that goes along with that. I think we try to give voice to that as as best we can. We're not just pumping sunshine out here, but um, I think we have learned along the way that people appreciate optimism. People want you to say nice things about their team and not, for it not to be a dunk contest. Um, we're, we're not above that. Obviously, we do that too. But, you know, we, we try to occupy this, this lane that is somewhere between being optimistic and being factual while at the same time putting our own spin on things. So it's, you know, it's easier said than done, as you guys know. I mean, it's 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 kind of tough to establish your your own voice in a crowded space like ours. But um, we've we've had the benefit of doing this for a long time. And um, I think we're pretty in touch with our fan base. We we know what they appreciate. Our fan base has always been really good to us in terms of giving us suggestions and feedback and and helping power the show. So if anything is going to help this continue to grow in the way that it has, it's going to be our our verballers, the people that listen is, listen to all the shows and the people that give us, you yeah. know, great feedback along the way and tell us where we should go next. Yeah, uh, the other bit or what you know, segment that you guys do weekly, the window of opportunity, I find brilliant. And I I gauge maybe this is like the segue into the Nebraska football talk, but I truly gauge our relevance because I find you guys very like unbiased and like honest about it of like where you put us in your window of opportunity each week. And I always call Andrew afterwards because usually right right around September, you're like, we got to watch. We got to watch Nebraska, Colorado. Like you you never know. Maybe, you know, Frost is going to turn around. Here comes Polini. Here comes like, you have have us ranked. And then like by October, we're either like not in any windows or we're like in the bathroom break or you just like (laughs) skip over it all together. I always call Andrew like, Andrew, they skipped us again. (laughs) It's over. Season's off the rails. We're not, we're not in a window of opportunity. We didn't even get mentioned. We, we're not even in it. We we came to an interesting crossroads last season because we started doing recap episodes late on Saturday nights. Oh, and yeah. it's just Dan and I doing this. I mean, we have some folks that help with with other aspects of of kind of like the solid verbal as a whole, but for the most part, it's Dan and I collecting all the information and and putting the show in order and doing the editing and the filming and all like it's pretty much a two man operation with the exception of some folks who, who help out kind of on the periphery. And so it's like, we had to make a choice at least, at least with respect to that recap show with how are we going to cover this whole damn sport now that we have less time than ever before to prep. (laughs) And we also need to do so in a way that's like, staying true to who we are and to and to all the reasons that people like to listen to us and so um this is a long way of saying that we don't mean to leave anybody out whether it's on a preview episode or a recap episode but you don't have to sugarcoat it okay no (laughs) but we have we have such a finite amount of like time that we're able to like dissect all this information we can only talk talk about about the top 40 teams in the country yeah we know where we stand okay (laughs) you said it not me i did not say that (laughs) i don't want to be on record saying that but um maybe we could segue into nebraska by by saying that i don't think that will be the case this season at least not for the early part of this season because i think nebraska is crazy interesting for a whole variety of reasons okay okay dave you want to get into nebraska you want to go broad first do you want to go broad and then in? Yeah, we'll you, go broad and then in. So the, the, one of the big questions that I have, just based on the show and everything here, um, we'll get into some fan bases because one of the one of the other great segments of your show, and we're going to get into a segment that I call Cheer Tears. The this one of the great segments is the reverbs. When you guys listen, for those who have not listened. This is where they basically take voicemails and mash them up and they're from across the country, all these different fan bases. And um, there's a there's a show called like Big Red Overreaction. It's basically that, which is where people call in, leave voicemails and they overreact or they do it on air and uh, they just get it all out and everyone airs their their laundry. Some of them are celebratory. Some of them are negative, negative, et cetera. 
but you guys probably listen to hundreds and hundreds of these in order to create a couple minute segment. Uh, and you got to <laughs> filter through some things and, and uh, sift them out a little bit. And so here's, here's the game that we're going to play. It's basically going to be you ranking the fan bases into four categories. Number one is pretty indifferent. Number two is surprisingly, they do care. Uh, that's just fan bases that, you know, they surprisingly have a lot of passion. Three, let's do uh, rational, level-headed, and just great people. And then four is completely psychotic. <laughs> and so, so that's just most just, of them. That's just, most of them, Andrew. <laughs> off, off of the cuff, is there a fan base that that is out there that just strikes you when I say that, okay, pretty indifferent? And then we'll get into some Big Ten teams, but pretty indifferent. Who who uh, who strikes you as that? Uh, indifferent. You know, I mean, of course there are exceptions to this. I could only speak to my own personal experience dealing with some fan bases, but like, you know, I think I think you're talking about mid to bottom tier power conference teams, like Indiana. In, like a, like is that where we're going? Illinois, Illinois is the sure. first one that came to mind. Like there aren't a whole lot of like rabid Wake Forest fans. <laughs> yes, that, thank you. That I've had the privilege of speaking with Duke. You know, a lot okay. of ACC teams that that sort of um, totally that sort of rise to that level. Um, Love it. How about it, surprisingly, they do care. Like you're just like, wow, this Syracuse? this school really. Yeah, Syracuse. We've had very passionate Syracuse fans that have listened to us and written in over the years. Um, That's a good one. I would have never. Yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah, me me neither. Um, so I think I think Syracuse is probably the one that comes to mind first. Um, you, we had some passionate Duke fans write in. Okay. The last couple of years, they've weathered um, the storm. Weathered the storm or, you know, felt felt like they were part of like a moment with yeah. Mike Elko. Um, yeah. We've had right, some Paige. Dukies right in along the way. Gosh, I'm trying to think who else in the Big Ten. Um, Purdue. Mm -hmm. Purdue's a school that, Purdue. Purdue's a school that that does have, you know, a bit of a winning tradition. And um, you know, most recently with Jeff Brown when he was there, the spoiler maker thing. Obviously, yeah. they played played a pretty big role in the national conversation, just scaring the crap out of teams, if nothing more. And um, you know, we have we have a lot of Purdue fans that are very vocal that that write in and uh, you know give us a, a steady amount. Minnesota is another one. Hmm. Minnesota kind of caught me off guard, if I'm yeah. being honest with you. Yeah. Um, me Minnesota, too. They're all over our mentions. We like yeah, never know why. Minnesota is a bit in the Michigan camp from this standpoint, anything that you say that is remotely true, but unflattering, you will hear about it. Yes. Yes. You will yes. hear about it. And that caught me off guard. It yes. really caught me off guard. Um, okay. okay I like I'd that. I have to think more about others. There are definitely yeah. others. Okay. That That's a good tier. Sneak up on you. That's a good tier. This is just helping me ground for the, for the, the ones that we name. Uh, and then, all right. How about rational level headed, just like solid salt of the earth folks. Other than Nebraska, you can start there. Who's next? Other than Nebraska. Um, TCU. Okay. Okay. I like it. That may, that may no, be a uh, mischaracterization, yeah. but I, no, I, I don't say, see them as having too many enemies. I can say with certainty that two years ago when TCU was in the national championship, the level headed feedback that we got from people was like very refreshing. <laughs> Yeah, And it was, it definitely took on a tone of, we're very happy to be here. We don't think we're going to win, yeah. but we're very happy to be here. This is awesome, yes. which yeah. I thought was healthy. And to kind of build on that, there didn't seem to be expectations that it was going to be an annual thing for them to get back to that title game, which is where I think a lot of fan bases kind of go down the drain. Yeah. Um, it seemed as though the expectations were were relatively in check. Yeah, that's got to be nice to just have a nice appreciative group. Yeah, so so I think TCU is one um, level-headed. I West Virginia people, really? 
they're very passionate. This this is not my way of saying they're not passionate. They're very <laughs> yeah, passionate. No, uh, yeah. But I found that the feedback that I that I get often from West Virginia folks are, um, you know, it's it's among yeah. some of like the smarter, more like informed high high IQ fans. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. they they know their team really well, but they're not blind to what's going on elsewhere around college like football. It. How about um? I mean, I'm just looking forward to this answer, but who? <laughs> I say the words completely psychotic. Yeah. I mean, who, kind of everybody else. <laughs> who jumps out? Yeah. Everyone, <laughs> the rest. Kind of, kind of everybody else. The field. Um, I, have there... like, I have like one team a year where I will say something about a team. And then the fan bases for that team will just be on me all year. <laughs> and last year it was Michigan. Oh, and, wow. And look, I... I picked Michigan to win the title at the start of the year. Yeah. Then they made a... it to the playoff against Alabama. That's not enough. And I buckled. And <laughs> I said, well, I'm, I'm going to pick Alabama here. I'm not going to go against Nick Saban with all this time to prepare. I just, the game was close. Yeah. Michigan won by what? Three in overtime, whatever it ended up. I forget what the score was, but like the Alabama pick wasn't on its face that bad of a pick. <laughs> they could have won the game if a few things go in their favor. Yeah. Um, but but Michigan fans, like again, to the point I made earlier, anything sure. remotely true but unflattering, it was you. <laughs> so you good. just you never stopped hearing about. You had it. your head on a pike afterward. Yeah, I had the same thing happen to me a couple of years back with Florida State. I feel like I've made amends oh, with man. the Florida State fan base. That's a tough fan base. Yeah, but for Florida State definitely has a segment that is um, just you cannot reason with them. Ohio State, oh. pretty much any of these bigger tier. Yep. major school major school blue blood programs like just, you're just you're gonna have a pretty big segment of that base that <laughs> is is very vocal and it doesn't matter how much logic you use it's never going to get through love it all right dave go ahead and all right nebraska where would you put us between psychotic and rational level-headed those are the only two choices i think more level-headed if i'm being <laughs> honest and this has kind of surprised me because what I found about Nebraska over the last, let's say, you know, since Frost got there, four or five years, whatever it's been, what I found is despite the fact that there were really high expectations when Frost got there, hmm. it seems as though at least the people that I have had the good fortune of interacting with, yeah, it seems as though folks are pretty grounded in terms of expectations. Yeah. I have spoken to I'm any not. odd number of, of <laughs> any odd number of Nebraska fans over the last two, three seasons. And I have been pleasantly surprised at the number of people who have not been unrealistic in their expectations. You know, mm -hmm. like we did a we did a show a couple weeks ago with Mitch Sherman, who, you know, like mutual friend of the, of our pods. Um and some of the feedback we got from Nebraska folks was like, Hey, we don't think we're going to win 10 games. We want, we obviously we want to, Yeah. we don't think we're going to win 10 games. We kind of just want to make a bowl. We want it mm. to feel like something yeah. is building. That's more important than the win loss record at the end of the season. And I just found that really refreshing. Um, obviously when things were going South with, with frost, there were different segments within the fan base, but I, I just felt even then, when emotions were running high, most of the feedback, at least that we got, and I'm sure you get more of it being part of the Nebraska community. I thought it was pretty level-headed yeah. and, and not psychotic. It was very like down to earth and in touch with reality. <laughs> Appreciate that. I think, it's, well, I think it's, it's, it's loyal to a fault as I X4 where, I mean, we sell yeah. out every game, regardless of if we're making a bowl or for five and seven or four and eight or whatever it is. And, but I, I do think there is, and you kind of touched on it with Mitch in your in your podcast, how there's scar tissue, I think is what he called it. How, you know, it's sort of been broken down in a lot of ways, where like we we're so dominant, not just in the 90s, but 70s and 80s and 90s, all the way through to early 2000s. Um, but then, I mean, when you break a fan base down to like not making a bowl for seven straight seasons, you know, you kind of come up and everyone's like, uncle, like, all right, hey, hang on, please. Let's just get to a bowl. We'll build up to eight sure, games. Yeah. We'll build up to 10. Like, we'll get back to, like, you know, everybody hammered Polini, and now everyone's kind of sitting here like, 10 and 2 sounds pretty yeah, right. good. It's, it's like, uh, <laughs> this is like 
like after you change your tire to like the spare and then you're like on the highway and you're like i just kind of just want to make it at this point yeah right <laughs> that's that's that is uh that's where we're at but we're still true true fan uh, all right let's do some rapid fires here dave ohio state where are you throwing them uh i mean they're 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 among the most irrational it's it's an incredibly rabid fan base and i i would i would throw them more in like the florida state camp yeah in my experience than um you know some of the others that i mentioned before it's it's a very big fan base it's a very very passionate yeah. fan base and they are. i think Things have been amped up to a million now that they've lost to Michigan three straight years. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So like we're starting to have weird conversations out there in the college football <laughs> ether on our show with respect to, hey, what happens if Ryan Day loses again to Michigan? I, I, he's I, eleven he's an eleven and one every season now. It's insane. I know. We did we did a podcast episode. We did a mail two mailbag episodes this just week. today. Didn't you yeah. say he's thirty nine and three? Is that did I hear that Some, right? Something like that. It's it's an incredibly successful record. In the and, in the regular season, he's like thirty nine and three. He's and, lost like three games. <laughs> They're all them in Michigan. With without fail, like we have heard from, I don't know. Let's say a dozen, maybe, Ohio State fans that have written in and like contested our comments that you can't fire ryan day <laughs> and i'm like well, what if, what if he goes like 11 and one and they're gonna go to the playoff the next week they're like yeah. fi fire him on the field like, <laughs> fire Dead. him on the field like you got to beat michigan Gone. so i appreciate that level of passion yeah okay and i'm not i'm not here to kind of demean yep. anybody i mean i know how it is to be a big fan of a team so Keep on, keep on being you. But I think, I, I mean, now that they're spending twenty million dollars, or whatever that number is going to end up being, like I feel like it is a do or die in some instance of like if you can't win with a twenty million dollar roster. <laughs> but yeah, you know. I mean, but he, but they're not going to fire him. I think is the point. He'd leave. He'd yeah. go somewhere else. I, I don't think that it would ever be a situation where they're like, sorry, Ryan, because who are you going to get to replace him? That's always, that's always the next question, and I, I don't know you know, who, who better you're going to find. It's obviously a great job. Yeah. It'd be a very difficult, that's, uh, I mean, that's a very difficult position to, to fill with kind of like the guy you're looking for. But, really unthinkable. Yeah. Go to the it's playoff really, every, go Dan, to playoff Dan, every my co-host often says that college football is an infection. And I think <laughs> Ohio state yeah. among others is like a, a pretty sickest. good example of why. Yeah. All right. How about Iowa? As you can see these lovely fans on your screen. <laughs> Iowa just good humble folks flipping off everyone. Yeah, I there Iowa fans are I think split between rational and level-headed and also ones uh, people that I would just describe as being just like straight up stubborn. Hmm. And I and like what comes to mind and I I get that this might be a bit of a clunky comparison. I'm not I'm not hearkening back to the bad stuff but just like as Penn State grad, mm -hmm. after Joe Paterno was gone, after they forced him out, mm -hmm. rightfully so, after all that, oh, yeah. you know, scandal bit, there were still a, and there still are people within the fan base that have never really moved past the Joe Paterno era. Sure. And they, they kind of long for that style of Penn State football and those days of Penn State football. And it doesn't matter what happens under James Franklin. Like he's always sort of the enemy and, you're not going to stick for him because Penn State football is different now. And I see some of the same points of overlap with respect to feedback that we get talking about Kirk Ferentz. Because <laughs> Kirk Ferentz is obviously a bit of a punching bag, right? If only because of what's going on with offense. But a good coach, he's been there a long time, mm -hmm. won a lot of games, sometimes against all odds. Um, I, I don't think we're going to question whether or not Kirk Ferentz is a good coach, but He's definitely not a great offensive coach. Correct. And because of that, he's been very much in the news. We've brought it up on our show countless times, and it never ceases to amaze me the number of people who comment on YouTube videos or send in emails or comment on social media about like, you know, you got you guys, you guys aren't giving Kirk the respect he deserves. I think okay. we are. I mean, <laughs> you're doing you're he's doing been there since ninety nine. He's won a lot of games. I think since ninety nine. He's won a lot of games. And it's like, um, 
at some point you got to field an offense in this new era of college football. Like (laughs) you got to track with me here, guys. It's clearly you understand this is a problem, but I just refuse to see it sometimes. Yeah. It's wild. It's been decades of the same football. Uh, well, second, but before we do that, I was actually, Ty, I was at that game, um, the Penn State Nebraska game right after Joe Paterno. Oh, so was I. Cr- I mean, yeah. so you were that, that was the weirdest game like, day experience I've ever been to in my life. I, yeah, it's like somber. Yeah, as a student at Penn State, um, as somebody who has been to countless games at Penn State, I live in the state of Pennsylvania, like all of these, all of these points of connection. I've got a fair amount of knowledge for what game day is like at Penn State. Yeah. I've never seen anything like that in my life. That, oh my was, that was the weirdest, most uncomfortable. Yeah. Everybody was in the crowd and no one really knew what to do. Yeah. I, Every, I will say I was very surprised. Um, a lot of folks were like, be careful there. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. Like, as a Nebraska fan visiting, the fans were extremely nice to us. Extremely nice. Yeah. I think probably because they didn't like know what to do. And I, you know, we had heard it's very hostile there and it's like a crazy environment, all this stuff. And it was very like, odd. it was very like Penn state fans were like, Hey, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Like, I was like, Oh, okay. Thank you. And then the whole vibe was very weird. Remember they prayed before the game. Yeah, it, was, it was so weird. They it prayed was... before the game. And then they're like, I think we should play a football game. Yeah. And then they're, they're kind of <laughs> cheering and not really cheering. It's very bizarre. <laughs> it was, it was truly one of the most weird things that I've experienced in person. I mean, just in covering the sport all this time now, um, very few things I could compare it to. It was just like yeah. everybody was there to watch a game, but like nobody really wanted to be there. It was strange. Very bizarre. <laughs> like we had tickets, we had to use them, but yeah. uh, we yeah. don't know if we're supposed to cheer yeah. if that's okay. What's right. going on? So it was yeah, a huge, like, the huge game. Like yeah. it, it was yeah. in the Big Ten standings and stuff at the time. And yeah. like for the players, they were probably like, this is bizarre. <laughs> All, All right, right, next up we these. got uh we gotta get the Husker talk. Let's get through these guys. Yeah. All right, hit me with Minnesota. Well, or Minnesota. Yeah, I think uh Oh yeah, we covered them. We covered Minnesota. What's the UCLA? Let's see UCLA. Yes. Um kind of indifferent. Yeah. Yep. Kind of indifferent. There there are exceptions. There are exceptions on my Patreon at Verballers.com. Sure. But um I would, I, I would say generally. I was wondering the vibe on UCLA just with them joining, and and it seems like of of the four, I'm like, man, I you just don't hear much about UCLA fans. I I would say generally indifferent if I had to bucket them in any of those categories. Yeah, and then Michigan, you throwing in up the. Uh, yeah, they're they're in the, in the Ohio same State Bank. Ohio State. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, 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 wait, one more one more thing. We're, this, is, this is our segue. Yes, I, it is. I don't know if you checked your stats, but yeah, this is our segue into Husker football. Uh, 14,000 views compared to all of your others that are like right around a thousand, maybe yeah, 2,000, 3,000. That one really popped. popped. That one popped. Husker fans, nuts. It's also a great episode. So, anybody who's listening, you should check this uh, episode out. Um, really good episode. But let's, I mean, Andrew, let's segue into Husker football. We got, we got over a thousand folks here live. It's June 13th. It's a random Thursday night and we have a thousand fans that are sitting here waiting to hear what Ty wants to say about Nebraska football. Let's go. Just rip, rip, rip the bandaid off. Just tell us what do we, (laughs) we think we're back. What does back mean to you? Oh, here it comes. What does that mean to you? This isn't a therapy session, Ty. (laughs) What does back mean to you? Okay, I'm going to I'm going to you and I'll tell you if it means the same for me. Back for me is that this is the this is I, I don't even I can't even really explain it, but that we are we have a chance to be in the conversation in that top 25 conversation every week playing competitive football into November and that this is suddenly the deepest team that we've had in years and that there's Instead of kind of like, well, if this goes right, and if this goes right, and if this goes right, and if this goes right, it's kind of a, I'm pretty sure this should go right. (laughs) Like we have a more of a proven defense, a top 10 defense returning. We have just a couple too many, I think, question marks to maybe have everybody on offense for uh, everyone to kind of say, oh, this team is legit, legit. But I think it's nice to have some sort of stability coming back with a defense that can probably pick the offense up when it's down 
and the best depth that we've had in quite a while too. That to me is is being is if it's not back, it's one step closer. Right. So to to the talking point from earlier, then do you have an expectation in terms of wins and losses, or is it more of a vibe? Yeah, state? I mean the number's somewhere around twelve. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, that's fair. Uh, I would say uh, it, to get you a real number. I mean, I, I, even and keep going back to what Mitch said. It's like winning the games you're supposed to win. Yeah, winning the games you're supposed to win gets a state wins. And you look at our you look at our schedule like it's you workable. win the games you win the games you're supposed to win, which every time we pull up the schedule every year you're just like ah yeah there's eight wins there, and then there's four yeah um, so I would say that that that's where it's like you do the things you're supposed to do you win the games you're supposed to win, and then you compete which we have been we compete very well against the top teams we just never beat them that that to me is yeah let's anchor on eight and give me a perspective on eight. Well, I mean, they could start six and zero. Oh. With the way that the schedule is set up. The, Talk to me. The first six weeks of the schedule, I'm looking at it now. UTEP, Colorado, Northern Iowa, Illinois, Purdue, and Rutgers. They could win all those games. They've got enough depth to win all those games. Um, you know, I mean, Colorado maybe is the great X factor. I know that's a huge that rivalry. Is. Thankfully, it's in Lincoln. Yep. So yep. That, that'll be obviously fun. But, y you know, you start out the season, I think, in a really favorable way presumably because you're going to have a freshman quarterback and there hmm. are changes elsewhere on offense. I'm not going to misrepresent myself guys and act as if I've done like the full Nebraska deep dive. I know the two deep and all that stuff. I mean, I can speak to it from a higher level. I'm sure than than you and, and um, you know, or I prefer to speak to it from a higher level, at least, at least at this point in June, than maybe you guys and many of the folks that are listening at home, um, but you know, we've, we've done a fair amount of research already. We've talked to guys like Mitch and we've been examining these schedules now, especially within the context of an expanded big 10. And so I just think it really sets up well for Nebraska. Nebraska is one of those teams to me that, as I said at the top is one of the more interesting programs in college football right now. Um, and it, it stems from the fact that they do have some modicum of stability now. Yeah, stability in this day and age in college football is kind of like the currency. That is yeah. the thing that everybody wants. And obviously we've got things like the portal and NIL and conference realignment and expanded playoff, all these big structural changes. If you have stability within your program, that's the Everything. most important thing. And yeah. that is what Matt rule has been very good at in the college ranks. I was actually quite impressed with what Nebraska did last season. They were beat up on offense. There was a lot that went wrong on offense. We don't need to do that post-mortem. But defensively, they were a really solid unit. They bring a lot back this year. And Matt Rule has gone out there. He's added depth. He has tried to raise the floor in terms of talent for this roster. Um, obviously, bringing in Dylan Raiola has, has brought a ton of hype as well. But it just seems as if it will be a slow build under rule the way it was a slow build at temple yeah. the way it was a slow build at at baylor yeah. so i don't i don't know if this is the quote unquote year like your hat says but <laughs> i think i think we will see progressively and gradually over the course of the next couple seasons for as long as rule is there he will turn this program into one that is stable he will turn this program into one that is focused more on development and less on getting like quick wins that type of thing i mean i think his programs have tended to be built in a really solid way from the ground up and so that that is what i look at most with respect to expectations um yeah they were so beat up a year ago it really tested their depth this year depth yeah. should be better if they're hurt again i don't think it'll be quite as catastrophic on offense if they can manage right. the early part of the schedule I mean, the, the the back half of the schedule is there. I mean, there are plenty of teams in the back half of the schedule. Indiana's got a new coach, new quarterback. UCLA's also got a new coach. Yep. Who knows what to expect from USC this mm -hmm. year? The game's on the road, but USC's got some of their own issues. Even schools like Wisconsin. Who knows what to expect from Wisconsin with a new starting quarterback, Tyler right. Van Dyke. So I just feel like I, I tend to look at these schedules often and point out the teams that have question marks. And 
there are plenty of teams in the schedule that have far more questions than Nebraska does. And I think that's a pretty good place to be. Yeah. The thing that, um, you know, just engaging, like, it's funny. I, I, I have a friend that's, that is a, you know, he's a big college football fan, but he's, you know, not explicitly a Nebraska fan as, um, and he kind of has this just neutral stance. And I basically said, Oh, well, we were going through the schedule last year. And I was like, Oh, well, we should beat them. And and I think we should beat them. And, and then he just like paused me once and he was just like, why? And I was, and then I had to like think a lot. And I was like, I, you know, I don't really know why we should, we should beat them. But I think this year, the thing that I guess um, is that now there's some tangible evidence, I guess. Yeah. I think there was in these last few seasons, even though like I could talk myself into seven and five and whatever, it was a little bit more of like hypotheticals and, and there's still hypotheticals, of course, but like this year, I guess, okay, we needed receivers. We brought in, we right. went to town in the portal and we, we red shirted several players last year that could have been, you know, starters. Yep. And so you're returning a bunch of depth of receiver now. Okay, great. Awesome. We needed O-line depth. We got two guys back that are going to be uh, fifth and sixth year guys. Yep. They could have been gone. You know, there's just a, a lot of these question marks that are, that are, that feel like this is a good year to be old in the new big 10. Yeah. And it's a good year to have this returning experience that just to me feels like I, I, I'm not able to kind of, I don't have as many question marks. Well, and I, one thing I try to do when I go through and study for our previews that we usually do at some point in like early to mid July, I try to check my own source of optimism for some of these teams. <laughs> And I have often fallen into the trap where I look at a schedule and I say, wow, that schedule's really good. I really like that schedule. Yeah. And based on the schedule alone, I am projecting kind of optimism. I've done that more times than I could count with schools like Ole Miss or yeah. TCU over the, I mean, not, not so much in like the current iteration of the SEC. Yeah. Right? You just find that you're picking names. You're like, oh, Ole well, Miss you're, you're versus them. A, They'll, you're looking Ole at Miss a schedule. Win. You're looking yeah, at a schedule yeah. and you're saying, ah, oh, that, that road, I, I would take that road if I were playing in that conference. That that seems like that would be very manageable. And I've tried to stop doing that as much based solely on a schedule because obviously there are a thousand other factors that that play into it. But what I think is cool for Nebraska this year, not only does the schedule look pretty favorable to me relative to some of their peers and throughout college football, but I do know that Matt Rule's got a track record. And his track record has been like not necessarily year one, but by the time you get to year three under Matt Rule, yeah. usually it's a system. He's developing talent. He's built from the lines out. He's got good depth. Players want to go there because they know he can turn them into something. And, um, you know, I think, I, I hope anyway, year two now under Rule will will kind of give us some glimpses of that against what appears to be a pretty favorable schedule. Now, the, the X factor is Dylan Riola, in my view. And yeah. maybe it's, Maybe it's cliche to say it at this point. I'm sure you guys have probably talked until you're blue in the face about him. But if if he goes out there and is half as good as the hype around him, mm -hmm. you know, then, then eight eight wins feels like it's much more yeah. attainable. Um, you're going to have to expect some true freshman mistakes. I think that goes with the yeah. territory. I don't care how good he is. But um, no, you, you don't know, know how fast this hype train can go. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I I. I've been around the block with this for a long time and I know how the hype train goes, but what <laughs> yeah. I like again about the schedule is it, it gives him an opportunity to settle in with, be, with, yeah. with the team, with the offense before they get to some of the heavy hitters on the schedule. And yeah. uh, you know, if he can I, work out some of the kinks before then they'll be better for it. There's a couple components jumping on there that it, it, a big component of last year was like, man, if we just had a competent basic quarterback, yeah, we would have won eight games last year. Mm -hmm. like, oh well, now we have the number one quarterback in the country, and we've never, you know, we've never even had a five-star quarterback in Nebraska. This is totally new territory for us. Um, but what we get caught up in times as I look at the schedule is it does look great, and it looks great every time I look at it. I'm like, oh, Illinois, duh, Purdue, win, yeah. duh, Colorado, win. Uh, Illinois beat us three of the last four. Purdue right. has beaten us like <laughs> yeah. three, you know, three of the last four years. We yeah. lost to Colorado three straight times. Like I, I just chalk those up as wins because I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah, we should be, we should be. Those teams stink. 
Those people don't know. I think that's terrible. I'm like, oh, we stink. So I think we get we get caught up in that of like, oh, actually, yeah. that's the track record your friends probably you just using your like, name. Yeah. Yeah. You're just yeah. like, well, we should just win. But what? Um, I mean, not to open the gasket, but I, it's just this is our first tough one. Colorado. What? What do you think of Colorado? Ty? Like, I mean, we're they're, we're deep in it, and yeah. their fans are insane, and it's all over like everywhere. But like, I can't quite figure out like I, when they be, they beat the heck out of us last year, and I was like, man, maybe he's figured it out. And then they lost every game since. But now we're back to talking about Colorado in the playoff, yeah. which is bananas to me because I'm like, did nobody watch them lose every game last year? So I, are, I, I don't know what to make of it. Their fans aren't even insane. They're just like, it's like they were like an unplugged computer for like eight years. And then like someone plugged them back in and they're like trying to get all caught up with, <laughs> they're, they're glitching. They're just like glitching nonstop. And they're like, they're like, what? We're a national title contender. What, like, one of the more, interesting episodes that we've done and i will we'll probably try to do it at some point in the next month month and a half or so um but guy by the name of dan carlin who runs hardcore history oh i love it yeah very very popular podcast is like a huge colorado fan Uh, and we we've had him on each of the last two years talking about colorado football last year was really interesting because it was this whole dion thing and he he's very much a traditionalist and misses West Coast football and Pac-12 and kind of laments the state of affairs in college football, how things have turned into a big business. But, um, you know, understanding a little bit more about the Colorado fan experience has been, I think, somewhat enlightening for me, for Dan. Um, And I think people like Dan have been somewhat crowded out at least of the online sphere by a lot of bandwagon fans who are just yeah. really excited to root for Dion, really excited that he's trying something new. Um, and frankly, plenty of people who just kind of transfixed by the story. I mean, yeah. I was transfixed by the story last yeah. year. Yeah. You can't take your eyes off it. It's you true. couldn't, I mean, you couldn't look away. And, Absolutely um, true. Yeah. So I, like I think that was part of the plan for the, despite the fact that there's plenty of criticism for how he's building a roster and how he's not doing high school recruiting. I don't think he is building a roster. I think he's just, <laughs> well, he's building a roster, just not the conventional way. Strapping he's doing, for he's parts. doing it almost entirely through the transfer portal, which has not been done before and yeah, not, not nearly to this level. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And, and so he's trying something new and you know, like from my perspective, okay, that's interesting. I, I don't, it didn't work last year. Could it work yeah. this year? Maybe they get better at it. I don't, it could. I, I don't know where, but so that that part I think makes it really difficult for me to, um, fully gauge where Colorado is. I I think they'll be better. Um, what I worry about though is it's going to end up being the show on offense, and hmm. it's going to be entirely on him to do what they did last year, like scramble around, throw the ball deep try to do whatever they can to negate an offensive line that didn't block at all a year ago. They didn't play defense at all last season. I haven't seen a whole lot of proof that they have fixed some of those glaring weaknesses. Like compare and contrast what Nebraska did in the offseason with what Colorado did in the offseason. It's like night and day. Nebraska was being targeted. Nebraska went out after depth. Nebraska seems to have something of a plan behind what they're doing. That's not to say Colorado doesn't. It just feels so different and so scattershot that it it makes it really hard to project. So, um, I don't really know what to make of them. I am I am definitely not seeing Colorado this season through the most optimistic lens. Um, I just don't see enough proof that they've gotten a whole lot better in the off season. And I am doing my best to try and listen to more fans like Dan, who I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And less of the folks who live in our YouTube comments or our email <laughs> inbox who maybe Greetings. are just passing through and <laughs> and are you and I will be a unrealistically optimistic about Colorado football. I mean, like Chris we had so many Chris. people last year talking Colorado playoff and you know, Dion has taken this sport by storm and no one's ever seen anything like it. And and they're right. He did take it by storm. We've never seen anything like it. They True. still didn't block or play defense. So, like, <laughs> yeah, we've never seen that either. 
Yeah, or we've never seen it work. We've seen it. We've never seen it work. The dichotomy between I me mean, because they hired Rule and, and Dion in the same cycle, and there's a lot of folks who were like, I mean, not a lot of folks in Nebraska. I don't think anybody really in Nebraska wanted Dion, but it was such a dichotomy. Yeah. And then the fact that he, you know, rolled up and just beat the heck out of us, we were like, wait yeah. a second, this whole, yeah. you know, the stability, which now in hindsight I would pr much prefer Rule. I think he's building something to all your points, but it is weird where you're like. Well, they just beat the heck out of us with just a yeah. bunch of random transfer portal kids. Like met these guys two weeks ago. Yeah, I'm like, why don't we do that? It's crazy. You know, I, I I fell into it because it was head to head. And it, you know, it's, if he does it again, I'm gonna be like, okay, like, what yeah. are we doing? Because this guy's just pulling kids off the street and beating us again. I appreciate <laughs> the fact that he's trying something radically different. Sure, I appreciate that. That is my jam. Okay, yep. I am cool with that. And. What we learn as a result of this, I think, will be very interesting, and it will certainly impact college football in some way moving forward. Um, I also don't think we know enough yet about the Dion plan to know that it's going to be a failure or a success. I think we need more data before we, we got one season a year ago. Yeah. Let's see what happens after Shador goes pro. After Travis yeah. Hunter goes pro, let's see what that looks like then. Yeah. Is Dion going to give a rip about Colorado football after he <laughs> graduates? Like, I don't know. I have no idea. So there are so many unknowns with this program that, um, right. you know, I tend to get long-winded about this. I apologize. No, that's all good. I just don't know how to project them. I have no idea how to project Colorado this year. Yeah. All right, Andrew, hit your – I want to be respectful of uh, Ty's time. Hit your last two because these are two, uh, two last good questions. Number 10 and 11 there. Um, yeah, well, so the, kind of the big thing, I guess, for me, is just the new Big Ten, the new the new order, everything that's going on, everything we're uh, heading into in the future. Um, two part question. So number one, is there anything that that you that gives you hesitation about Nebraska? Like what's the like what would be the biggest thing that you would want Nebraska to fix before heading into kind of this new order? And then two, how does this new order affect schools that are positioned like Nebraska versus one that's positioned maybe in the quote unquote lower tier. I, well, I know we've been in the lower tier, but let's say like an in Indiana or, you know, right. Purdue, like, like, are they going to just stay there forever? Is this going to become like, you know, talk to me about like, where's Nebraska at? How are we positioned? What would you fix uh, going into the future? Well, I think, I think the thing I would focus the most on, to start would probably be the offensive line. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel like last year when we brought this up on our show, we got some pushback, like, oh, the line wasn't that bad. You just don't watch Nebraska yeah. football. I've got the numbers in front of me. The numbers okay. are not kind to Nebraska football oh boy, with okay. respect to their line. Just they start spreading them. They gave up a lot of pressure. They gave up a lot of sacks. That's not entirely on the line. They also had <laughs> injuries. They had quarterback issues. Like, I know that it's like a holistic thing. But yeah. I think... I think we need to fix the line first and foremost because they were not very effective at running the football. And so much of the stress came on the quarterback position, which wasn't equipped to handle it last season. Mm -hmm. So that starts from the inside out. I would like to see them get better up front. Thankfully, I think Matt Rule is the guy who can help them fix that. Mm -hmm. And I think he's already taken steps to try and make that better this season. But it's just, it's hard when you're so hurt. It's hard when you're taking over day one at a new place and you have to kind of build from the ground up. So he's proven he can do that. I, I think the line is probably where I'm focused the most. Obviously, you know, you want skill talent, you want a better wide receiving or you want a better wide receiving core. You want a better quarterback. All that stuff goes without saying, but I think for me, it's, it starts with the line and yeah. I'm optimistic that that rule can do it. Um, a, as for what is Nebraska's place in all of this, um, I think you can win at Nebraska. I think you can win at Nebraska. I, like I think, that. I think especially with a guy like a Matt Rule, who's won at a bunch of different places and it's got a, a fairly varied experience when it comes to coaching football, you know, pro and college. Like the guy, at least in the college ranks, has, has a pretty good track record. You know what you're getting with him. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I'd go so far as to say that a guy like that can win pretty much anywhere. He He's already right. kind of putting his system in place and, I think they're going to be well equipped to kind of go into this new world order of things and, um, and, you know, hopefully get some momentum, get some wind at their back. So I, I think they're fine. Um, where it does get interesting though, is when you're talking about schools like, you know, Illinois or Indiana, not right. to pick on those guys, but 
we we have this growing golf in college football it's it's always what has given the sport its charm that david versus goliath aspect to every saturday knowing yes. that a 28 point underdog could on any given saturday knock off the number five team in the country whoever um that gap between the haves and the have nots has continued to widen with nil with the transfer portal yeah et cetera, et cetera. and so i think it puts smaller programs in a real bind Mm -hmm. It puts them in a real bind. It doesn't so much matter to them that the pathway to get into the playoff is wider. Um, in some cases, if you're in like the Big Ten East, if you're Maryland, if you're Michigan State, it doesn't so much matter that the divisions go away and maybe your right. schedule gets a little bit easier. You're always going to be up against this issue with NIL and with losing yeah. your guys to some bigger programs out there. How they deal with that, how college football deals with that, five years, 10 years down the line, that to me remains a big unknown. We can sit here and guess as to what that's going to mean in the grand scheme of things. I think the writing is on the wall that it is headed to a place that benefits the true blue, bro blue bloods of the, of the college football world yeah. and the big money institutions. But, you know, we don't really know that for sure at this point. It's a lot of assumption. So I think Nebraska is certainly in a better place than – yeah. A few of those schools that I mentioned, and especially now with Matt Rule, uh, I'll take a wait and see approach to see how things go elsewhere around college football for some of the the smaller programs, um, smaller power programs. I love I love that answer. I was the I think it's as soon as NIL broke, I was like, this is it. This is our like this is our chance. Like there's so few programs out there where Nebraska is the only program in the state. Yeah. And we've got a ton of money in the state and it all goes towards it. And you have loyal fans. And it's, you know, the reason we started this jerky business was like, all right, if we can pool the Husker fans, like all of the collective energy into one thing, this is it. And that's been almost even more frustrating is you're like, wait, we are doing that and it's still not working. <laughs> so yeah. I do, I like, I hope that turns into a, you know, a divide and like, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for Illinois to fall apart. I'm waiting for Purdue to fall apart and they haven't yet. And so I'm like, wait a second, when, when, like, when can we buy our way to the top? And that, it hasn't panned out yet. I think it will. Well, but. it could. And, and, you know, here's the other aspect of this. We talked about what Dion is doing at, at Colorado. And not to say that it's the same model at Nebraska. I, I, it would be sacrilegious to compare the two. I get that. But, like, what Dion is doing at Colorado is he is trying to fake it until he makes it. He is trying to kick up so much dust. <laughs> he is trying to become become kind of the media darling that makes Colorado a cool place to go and play. And I think he yeah. is hoping that transfers want to be part of that, that <laughs> high school recruits also want to be part of that. Well, there's a second part to that equation. You actually have to put guys in the NFL. You actually have to win football games. Yeah. He hasn't really proven that he can do that at scale yet. Maybe that'll yeah. change this year. But I think Nebraska, to their credit, got Dylan Rayola. If Love Dylan Rayola comes in, and again, I'll say it again, is half as good as the hype around him, that tends to build some momentum in the recruiting game. That yeah. tends to help recruit other players to want to come to Nebraska. That yeah. tends to make Nebraska more of a story, if yeah. only because they're on TV, they're a talking point every Saturday. These things have a, an interesting way of building and building and snowballing and eventually, hopefully, hitting critical mass. And so if you're Nebraska... I think the opportunity now in front of them with Dylan Rayola is incredible, right? Do whatever they can no. to keep him there because it's a brave new world where he could leave at a moment's notice. I don't think it'll happen. <laughs> there are connections there. Okay. It's not the same as, you know, some other guys who have left, but I think if they're able to kind of leverage the whole Rayola effect and yeah. build that into some positive momentum for the program, um, that would put them in a really, really strong spot moving forward under rule. Yeah. I mean, this is such a huge year for the future for us. hundred percent agree. Um, my, my last question, just getting back to, um, you know, college football and, and the direction that it's headed um, is kind of that 10,000 foot view. I mean, um, college football has needed a, a czar, you know, they've needed an emperor for a long time. <laughs> And um, and you have my vote. So oh, if you're if you're running, 
but here's the the question you know the big hitting question because it's such a broad scope but like what are the urgent things that need to be fixed in college football in order to maintain the same level of passion and the same level of interest you know five to ten years down the line like what are the things that that you're seeing that you're saying oh boy if this happens you know this could go down a bad road the the single most hated thing about this new era of college football and i mean i can speak for myself but i'm mostly speaking on behalf of the people that write in to me the dozens upon dozens upon dozens of emails that we get in a given week i it, overwhelmingly people hate thing about rivalries going away yep yes it is a rivalry driven sport it is a tribal yep. sport you care first and foremost about your team and then maybe about what goes on on the national scene mm -hmm. <laughs> like if you're if you're kind of like a super fan with your own team and then you care about national college football as a whole then you listen to my show but a lot of people don't because they only care about their team and they care about the yeah. rivalries True. that go along with that team. Losing some of those, or at least the threat mm. of losing some of those, is, mm -hmm. I think, a very, very urgent concern around college football. I don't know how you fix that. I, I don't see kind of like a, a, a clear pathway to, to fix that or to ensure that more won't go away in the future. Um, mm. Losing the Pac-12 was a huge black guy. A yeah. huge black guy for the sport. I mean, there are a lot of people. That. There are a lot of people who feel really dirty about that. Yeah, and everybody knows it was about money. They're not even trying to hide it anymore. This no. is a big time money decision. Thanks for coming out. Right, <laughs> a great conference down the tubes because the money wasn't good enough, or the Pac-12 out, you know, like kind of overvalued itself. Whatever, it, whatever the rationale was for that. Um. The thing that I think people are most afraid of is losing those bits of charm in college football. And so yeah. if I'm czar, if I'm, you know, in any kind of decision making position, yeah. um, Just I bring think, the regionality back. I think so. Yeah. I think I think trying to find a way to steer into what makes college football special yeah. is something that would need to be at the top of the list you can't influence everybody's schedule especially now in the playoff era where it pays to not lose games like it always paid to not lose games but now it pays to like not lose more than two so you're always going to have this conversation now maybe more than ever with respect to out of conference scheduling and things like that do we still want to play our rival does it make sense to play our rival kind of because they could prevent us from getting to the playoff etc um but i i would try to come up with some mechanism by which we could encourage schools to yep. retain those rivalries i don't know how you do it that's why i'm not bizarre but that's <laughs> yeah. i can tell you yeah. overwhelmingly that's the thing Someday. that people hate most about where this is all gone and uh yeah. I, I would try totally to true. as much as i could i know it's 100 percent true i mean it's like people love the the weirdness of it, the the yeah. territorialism, and like there's there's teams like Oregon State who are getting screwed that they, you know, of course they want to win a national championship, but they kind of also know I, that's probably not in our in our cards. But I tell you what was a huge deal is playing Oregon yeah. and playing Washington. Yeah. And playing Washington State and those those people that I see at the grocery store with the other team's hat on, that's a big deal to to them. Yeah. And, and, and you know, to, to be fair now, I mean, not all the rivalries have gone away. There are still right. plenty of them that have been kind of, you know, in some cases like Texas and Texas A and M, it's been restored. Right. So yeah. that's it's not all bad, but I I yeah, there there is this stigma out there that because this is all so driven by money and because we've got west coast teams playing in a conference based in chicago like all of this stuff has been thrown so on crazy. it's stupid right all of this stanford and the acc i was like i almost vomited when i heard that i still can't get it straight i still <laughs> it it's straight. you know i've compared it on my show to like the 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 houston astros switching to the al or what like it's 
yeah there are just these these parts of your childhood as a sports fan that you you can't deprogram that's it's and it's more like houston joining the dominican league or something right <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just yeah it's it's wild man it's crazy so um i just think that like that that fear of the money overtaking the charm sure. is is something that we would need to address yeah. now and i don't know how you do it Love it. i've got uh, one final segment if you've got a few more minutes to as, much, as much time as you need guys cool with that dave do it this is so speaking of weirdness this is a good segment be or a good segue into this segment i spent last night looking into I, I don't know what sent me down this rabbit hole but i was like you know what i gotta get tie in on this somehow all of the strangest lyrics and just odd lyrics coming from fight songs and team songs from around the big 10 <laughs> and and your job is for me to read this without any musical cues and tell me which school it is you down, you ready for that okay <laughs> okay Sure. There's hey, number sir. one. Some of these are so off the wall. I tell you what, songs in 1910 used to hit a little different. <laughs> um, all right. <clears throat> number one. Old Princeton yells her tiger, Wisconsin her varsity. And they gave the same old rah, rah, rah at each university. But the yell that always thrills me and fills my heart with joy is the good old oski wow wow that they yell at blank <laughs> i mean why did they mention wisconsin it's a big 10 school um oski wow wow illinois yes Bam. This guy is, is the true czar of college football is with us tonight. <laughs> no, I was like, I, I, it had to be someone old. They're mentioning yeah. Princeton. Anyone mentioning Princeton in, in today's college football is. I know, saw a shirt. Cool. I saw a shirt about that 10 years <laughs> ago. I want to say 10 years ago ish. <laughs> Stuck um, with him forever. Yeah, and I, I, because I got that, I got it wrong. Then I was like, "What? What is this?" And then I, I learned kind of that there was an association, but it's been a minute. But wow, okay, lucky guess. That's all right, one for Here's one. number two. <clears throat> we shall sing and be glad with the days as they fly, in the time that we spend in thy halls, and in sadness we'll part when the days have gone by, and the path turns away from thy walls. It's getting depressing. Till the waters no more and thy river shall run, till the stars in the heavens grow cold, we shall sing of the glory and fame thou hast won, that's, and the love that we bear for old gold. That's Michigan. <laughs> Iowa. Oh, close, but the old gold especially. Old gold. That is just one of the most depressing Does, hymns. I, I feel like Michigan. Doesn't Michigan have "We shall sing and be glad" in theirs yes. as well? I think that's, I think that is correct. I think they have that one. That's what I was kind of. Iowa's is just all about death, apparently, though. You said gold, so I should have picked up on that. That was bad. And in sadness will part when the days have gone by. That we, we shall, the, the be glad part is also in Michigan, though. Got it. I, okay. <laughs> to thy colors, true, we shall ever be. Firm and strong, united are we. Ra, ra, ra. For Sky U Ma. That's ra, ra, Ra. That's Minnesota. Ma for the Sky U Ma. Yeah. Just nonsensical language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called the Minnesota Rouser. All yeah. right. You're, you're two for three. Two for three. I got two more. Okay. Watch the points keep growing. Blank teams are bound to win. They're fighting. I said blank teams are bound to win. They're fighting with a vim. Ra ra ra! See, their team is weakening. We're going to win this game. <laughs> fight, fight, ra team fight. I don't know this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a mean guess. Give me a school that would use the phrase "fighting with a vim." I don't know about that, but that sounds like the dorkiest lyrics I've ever heard. <laughs> 
these are all these are all Big Ten schools. Yes. The dorkiest Big Ten school is Northwestern. <laughs> is it Northwestern? No. Your statement is true. Your answer is wrong. But it's Michigan State. Oh. And I my like first, yeah. This this felt like a like a white person trying to make a hip hop song. You know, like this was. <laughs> It's like a bad rap video. To be fair, the line was watch the points keep growing. Spartan teams are bound to win, which you yeah. would have obviously gotten Blank quickly. Are bound okay. To win. okay. See, their team is weakening. <laughs> We're going to win this game. I mean, it's so literal. It's so lame. It's like uh, a chatbot wrote it. Okay. <laughs> AI, AI fight song. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. The final one. You're about two and two. Uh, two, two, two. Yeah, two and two. All right, this is the decider. Our teams are there with bells. Their fighting blood excels. It's harder to push them over the line than pass the Dardanelles. So, victory's the, cl- the cry of blank. Our leather lungs together with a rah, rah, rah. And o'er the land, the loyal band will sing the glory of blank forever. I think your hint here is the Dardanelles. Um, I, what the, I, what I, have, I have no idea. Second hint, new Big Ten team. Oh, yeah, new Big Ten, one of the four. The vic- victory is the cry of blank. Our leather lungs together with a rah rah rah, and o'er the land the loyal band. I have no idea. <laughs> what are you even? Well, arguing? if you knew where the Dardanelles was, it's Washington. Okay. Washington. <laughs> oh, I actually don't even know if it's pronounced the Dardanelles. It might be Dardanelles. Could be French. Wow. <laughs> but that is um, just That's tough. The bizarreness of college football in a nutshell. <laughs> I mean. I, I wouldn't have known any of these. We we've been doing we've been doing videos. Um, so for for people out there who are interested in more of, of what we do, this is not of me course. trying to promote anything. But this, I I promise you, I'm tying this in. Um, the beauty of college football is that so many of the traditions that we hold very dear all started by accident. Yeah, they all started just with dumb kids with like weird things, um, you know, that, that people decided to go with. And we, we've been trying on our like social channels and whatnot to, to highlight some of those this off season, because it, again, like I said earlier, it, we're, we're big on the whole charm factor with college football. And, and so many of these things, um, they start by accident. They give college football its charm. They make it special. These fight songs, I think are no exception. Yeah. You get these odd lyrics that are like, what? <laughs> It was written like 1820. Like, what? Okay. I don't know what any of this means <laughs> anymore. It is, it, is no, back then. it is no current day context, but um, you, you find this throughout the sport. It, it truly is what makes it unique and uh, the best. Right. I will. I'm going to turn this into a promotion for you, though, Ty. We've got 1,200 people are still listening to us at 930 at night on a Thursday. Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. For those who are listening, check out Solid Verbal. It's fantastic. Go to Spotify. Go to YouTube. Check it out across all the Twitter, Facebook, every channel that you could possibly follow on uh, Patreon. What else are missing, Ty? What, where else can they follow you guys? We're we're everywhere, man. I mean, a- anywhere you can find a podcast, just look for the Solid Verbal. Um, our website, solidverbal.com. You can you can go there. You can read a little bit more about our backstory. But um, you know, wh- whatever social platform you're into, I haven't cracked Snapchat yet. I'm not really sure yeah. how to use that. But everything else, yeah. we've kind of figured out and. Um, you know, we've been we've been really pushing hard this off season. We'll continue pushing hard um, as as the season gets here. But um, our our community is known lovingly as the Verballerhood. Verballerhood. Um, and we would encourage everybody out there listening at home if if you love college football as much as us, if you want something that is lighthearted but informative, and hopefully something that can give you kind of a uh, the broad brush of college football with what's going on in the national conversation and whatnot. Um, all are welcome. We'd love to have you and uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Absolutely. Love it, man. All right. Well, so to the 1200, as we leave, this is going to be a one word answer. Yes, no, or maybe. 
we always believe this is the year every single year I go in thinking we're going to win the national championship every year until we lose, which is usually like September 1st. <laughs> Unbelievably. <laughs> yes, no, or maybe. Last question, and then I promise we'll let you go. No, 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 maybe's. No, maybe it's just yes, no. no. Well, I, yes, no. I mean, this I mean, is a okay. binary thing here, Andrew. Will no. Will Nebraska win a national title in our lifetimes? Um, define lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> define lifetime. Are we living to a hundred? A hundred. Existence of the Earth. No. Yes. How, how, no. Fifty years. We, yeah, fifty years. Fifty. Fifty years is a long time. It's a long time. I mean, who am I to say no? Yes, yeah. sure, yes. Come on. Yeah, that's clip that. I don't want to be on the side of no. I'm on a Nebraska show. Yes, we're going to clip that. Yes. We're going to edit that out. <laughs> that's the clip. Uh, that's, the sound bite. that's the clip. Edit out. Sound like that. Kai thinks we're going to win the national championship at some point in our lifetimes. We won't <laughs> yep. say it was 50 years. We'll cut out all the pauses. Great. Headline he it. He thinks we're going to win. Great. Kai, yeah, thanks perfect. so much for joining us. Really appreciate it, man. It's uh, it's been a pleasure to, to you know after ten years of listening to you, it's wild to talk to you for an hour and a half. So really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, absolutely, guys. And let's do it again at some point once the season starts up. We'd love oh, that. That'd be fun. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. <laughs>